Let's go ahead and open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank You so much for Your presence with us. Thank You for Your Word, which gives us life. Lord, I pray this night as we have these last three sessions that You would illuminate us, that You would open our eyes to see a larger world and to see Your truth in the midst of it. I ask, Lord God, that You would guide my words, that they might be clear. And in fact, Lord, I would just appreciate it if You got me out of the way and say what You want to say tonight. Thank You for this time, these people. Thank You for Your presence in every aspect of our lives. Whether all things are good, or something is busted or broken or sick or grieving, Lord, whatever the situation, we know that You walk with us and we cannot praise You enough for that. Guide our thoughts, I pray in Your name. Amen. Alright. i got a lot to cover, so I'm going to skip the Bible books tonight. We'll come back to that next Wednesday. Speaking of, uh, what are thoughts about the Wednesday before Thanksgiving? Yeah, and we don't normally meet on that Thursday or that Wednesday night because everybody's so crazy getting ready for Thanksgiving. So, okay, perfect. That that was that was kind of I'm I'm watching everybody's heads and just about everybody is going, uh uh-uh. uh. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for speaking for the group. You know, all right, all right. Question that we're still unpacking, and this will be the final uh, session of this. Is how much relevance? Revelance? Wow. Uh, orally lisdexic. Anyway, how much relevance or attention should we be giving to the book of the Apocrypha, such as the book of Enoch and other books removed during the Reformation? We've unpacked that over the last three weeks. I gave an introductory talk, and then we talked about what the actual Apocrypha is, and then we talked about the Pseudepigrapha, And tonight we get to talk about what I have been referring to this entire time as the Nag Hammadi. And I'm going to go ahead and talk in terms of the Nag Hammadi tonight, but I really want you to see beyond that. I didn't want to confuse you, so I used a different title. But a more accurate title would be the New Testament Pseudepigrapha. When you talk about the pseudepigrapha, that is the entirety. And most folks only talk about the Old Testament pseudepigrapha like we did last week. But the Nag Hammadi is one large chunk of writings that were also spurious, also false signatures, that would fit all the criteria of the pseudepigrapha, but they were written in the 1st and 2nd and 3rd centuries. So they're pseudepigraphal, but instead of tying to the Old Testament, like the stuff we did last week, they tie to the New Testament. So the Nag Hammadi probably makes about 80% of those writings. So that's why I have just been referencing that particular book. But there are other writings out there that are not part of the Gnostic Gospels, that are not part of the Nag Hammadi, that would also be considered a part of these New Testament pseudepigraphal books. And again, to remind you, pseudepigrapha just means false signature. Okay, An epigraph is the opening um, portion of a piece of literature that kind of gives the theme. It's your thesis statement. And so when you look at a Bible or some other writing, there's this opening, well, here's what, who's here, what, who wrote it and to whom and for what purpose. That's called the epigraph. And we know that the epigraph on these things are false. So it's a pseudo or false epigraph. And that's where the pseudepigrapha comes from. As we talk tonight about the Nag Hammadi and the New Testament pseudepigrapha, or you might refer to it as the Gnostic Gospels plus, Okay, there's all of these titles that are saying the exact same thing. I remind you again, back in 1946, they found a book, and in that book were 13 chapters and writings, and in that 
that book was found just outside the Egyptian city of Nag Hammadi. N-A-G space H-A-M-M-A-D-I. Okay, it's a place in Egypt. So <clears throat> the Nag Hammadi is called that because that's where it was found. Just like another group of writings called the Dead Sea Scrolls that were found, hmm, let me see, by the Dead Sea. Okay, that's, so they talk about these sometimes by where they're found. And by the way, there are New Testament and Old Testament pseudepigraphal writings in the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls aren't just canon books. There are also pseudepigraphal books that are a part of what we found in the various different jars at the Dead Sea. So again, it's not just the Nag Hammadi. There's some in the Dead Sea Scrolls. There's some in other places. So there's other writings that are out there that are New Testament time period. Okay. I have got more tonight than we're going to get through. And so, one of the first things I'm going to do is take this piece of paper off my desk and throw it over there. Because I'm not going to deal with it. That deals with Gnosticism. If we're going to talk about the Gnostic Gospels, well, what did the Gnostics believe? Somebody asked that question at some point in the future and I'll unpack it. But the reality is I would rather spend more time with the documents than with the history of the people who were promoting them. I think that would be more helpful for us to look at. To put it in very simple forms, the Gnostics believed that the world was created by an under-God that the real God is too good to have ever made something this messed up. And so, because there's this under God, the way that you actually connect with the real God is through illumination. I'll tell you what, you start reading Gnostic stuff and you start remembering what it was like to be in a jazz club doing readings in the 60s. Some of that stuff was just... I mean, everybody's sitting around in their chapeaus and some dude reading the poetry and everybody going, oh, deep. Welcome to a Gnostic church. It was all about gaining special insight. Gnosticism or Gnostic comes from the Greek word gnosis, which is knowledge. And the whole thing about the Gnostics is we have the secret squirrel ring. We have the special information nobody else has. That's why we're better Christians and the rest of the world really doesn't get it. Because it's all about illumination. Very much ties into more of the Eastern mysticism. Absolutely ties into Buddhism. Absolutely ties into a lot of those other Eastern philosophies. Never forget that Palestine, the area of Israel is called the Middle East. And if you look at a book of writings from the Middle East, it looks a lot like a book of writings from the East. There is a, if you were going to compare Jesus to philosophers, He is far closer to Confucius than He is to Plato in his presentation of the Gospel. Very Eastern in the way it's presented. And so it's important to understand that. So I'm going to let that go and just understand at some point I'm going to unpack Gnosticism for you guys, but not tonight. N.T. Wright is a Christian author, respected authority on the New Testament, and he wrote up uh, in one of his books where he was arguing against one of the... Uh, Got Gnostic Gospels, he wrote up kind of a, an overview that I just want to share just to set the mood. The four essential differences between the canonical Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the pseudepigraphal or Gnostic Gospels deals with these four areas. One, the biblical Gospels affirm Jesus as the continuation and climax of God's redemptive history with Israel. They recount how the long history of God's work through Israel came to its climax with the person of Jesus. 
Contrarily, the Gnostic Gospels completely detach Jesus from Israel and the history of Israel with God. The God of the Old Testament, as described by the Gnostic Gospels, categorize Him as evil and Judaism as totally lost. The Gnostic Gospels saw no connection between Jesus and the nation of Israel and the acts of God in the Old Testament. These reasons may be the biggest reasons why the Gnostic Gospels are not in the Bible. Because what we understand is that Jesus... Guys, his whole point in number one is what I've been trying to make the point for several months in Exodus and Leviticus. If you don't understand the Old Testament law, Jesus doesn't make any sense. If you take all of the sacrifice and all that's going on that we've been unpacking out of the equation, what you're left with is a philosopher teacher. And that's what the Gnostics tend to. They ignore the salvation of the Old Testament. They ignore the Lamb who takes away the sins of the world and they look at this individual who came and was enlightened and had special knowledge and so we need to follow Him. So they detach Jesus from Old Testament Israel. Second of all, the biblical Gospels told the story of Jesus in connection with the life of the early followers of Jesus to show all Christians a plan to follow as they follow Jesus. In a very different way, the Gnostic Gospels put Jesus in the position of giving a secret knowledge or a gnosis to some of His original disciples, the Gnostic disciples, to pass it along to others in a secret way. The belief in a secret message by the Gnostic Christians was implicitly a rejection of the quote-unquote mainstream Christian church and Christians in their open message to the world. Again, we're going to focus on the philosophy, not on the salvation. We're going to separate those two. And three, the biblical or canonical Gospels in presenting the story of Jesus proclaimed that in Jesus, God had manifested and launched His kingdom on earth as it was in heaven. In a contrary way, the Gnostic Gospels rejected the idea of the kingdom of God at work on earth in Jesus. The Jesus of the Gnostic Gospels was not interested in this world. He was mostly interested in fleeing from His earthly body and returning to the spirit world. This is a huge piece of Gnosticism that again, I'm not going to unpack tonight, but they see the body as evil and the spirit as good. And so you flee everything that is physical and material and pursue what is ethereal and spiritual. Anybody hearing a whole lot of transcendental... Transcendence and trans... Anyway... That the old transcendental meditation. I'm trying to think of the other term that transcendental starts. But anyway, yeah, that's where it came from was Gnosticism. You know, what we thought was new in the 1960s was actually written in the 100s and 200s. It's been around a long time. And fourth, the Gospel of the Bible were written in the first century, around 70 to 90 AD. On the other hand, the Gnostic Gospels were written in the 2nd century A.D. and beyond. The canonical Gospels were being read and quoted as carrying authority in the early and middle 2nd century, whereas we don't even hear of the non-canonical ones until the middle or end of that century. So these are follow-ons. They're not a part of the earliest manuscripts. Uh, by the way, I'm not going to go through all of the stuff that I've got here, but for those of you who like church father stuff, uh, the Gnostic Gospels are referred to, uh, and specifically I'm going to talk tonight about the Gospel of Thomas, uh, because that's the one everybody knows. That's the one uh, Brown made the big deal of in the Da Vinci Code, was, was the Gospel of Thomas, and why wasn't it included, and it should have been, and the, you know, all that junk. <clears throat> okay. So we're going to look at the Gospel of Thomas tonight and answer Mr. Brown's question <laughs> because it's stupid. That's Anyway, um, <clears throat> the earliest surviving written reference of the Gospel of Thomas are found in the writings of Hippolytus of Rome, 222-235, and of Origen of Alexandria in 233. In the 4th and 5th centuries, various church fathers wrote that the Gospel of Thomas was highly valued by many. Manny was a leader in Eastern philosophy that 
begins his own religion. Uh, and We'll unpack that in a second. But in the 4th century, Cyril of Jerusalem also mentions the Gospel of Thomas twice in his catechesis. He wrote, the Manichaeans, who were the followers of Manny, uh, also wrote a Gospel according to Thomas, which being tinctured with the fragrance of the evangelic title, corrupts the soul of the simple sort. In other words, you were set up for failure and you're going to get messed up if you read this book. He goes on to say, let none read the Gospel according to Thomas, for it is the work not of one of the twelve apostles, but of one of the three wicked disciples of Mani. That was his opinion back in the day. Um, the 5th century Decretum Galenaceum includes a Gospel attributed to Thomas which the Man Man Manichaeans use in its list of heretical works. So the early church was well aware of all of these and was fighting against it. So I want to try to share with you guys tonight two of the Gnostic Gospels or of the New Testament pseudepigrapha. And I want us to bounce these things back and forth so that you can see. You know, I could stand up here all day and say, we kick this one out because of this, 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 and this. And you'll walk out of here going, yeah, okay. But I think if we read through them, it'll make more sense. And don't panic. The Gnostic Gospels aren't as long as the canonical Gospels. We can actually get through them. And the first one that I want to share with you guys tonight if you want to go ahead and turn to John chapter 2 and verse 11, in about 10 minutes we're going to get there. But we're going to start with this writing first, and then I'm going to combat against it with the Scripture. Um, so let's start this. This book is called The Infancy Gospel of Thomas. Now I want you to hear what this supposed Thomas says about Jesus' infancy. Okay, Some of you are going to recognize it very quickly. Others of you are going to be like, oh, that's where that came from. I'd heard of that. And some of you are going to be like, well, that's dumb. Okay, <clears throat> so I'm just going to read it to you. I, Thomas the Israelite, thought it necessary to make known to all the Gentile brothers all the things done by our Lord Jesus Christ in the village of Nazareth after He was born in our region of Bethlehem. This is the beginning. The child Jesus was five years old. After it rained, He was playing at the ford of a flowing stream and stirring up the dirty waters. He gathered them into pools and made them clean and excellent, ordering them by word alone and not by ordering them by a deed. Then having taken soft clay from the mud, he formed twelve sparrows from it. But it was the Sabbath when he did these things, and many children were with him. But a certain Jew saw the child Jesus with the other children doing these things. He went to Joseph his father and slandered the child Jesus, saying that he made a clay on the Sabbath which isn't permissible and formed twelve sparrows. And Joseph went and rebuked Jesus, saying, Why are you doing these things on the Sabbath? But Jesus clapped His hands, ordering the birds with a shout in front of all, and said, Go, take flight like living beings. And the sparrows, taking flight, went away squawking. And having seen this, the Pharisee was amazed, and he reported to all of his friends. And the son of Annas, the high priest, said to him, Why are you doing such a thing on the Sabbath? And having taken a willow twig, he destroyed the pools and drained the water which Jesus had gathered, and he dried up their gatherings. But having seen what had happened, Jesus said to him, Your fruit will have no root, and your shoot will be withered like a scorched branch in a violent wind. And immediately that child withered away. From there he was going with his father Joseph, and someone running struck his shoulder. And Jesus said to him, Cursed be you because of your leader. And immediately he died. And the people who saw that he, he had died immediately cried out and said, From where was this child born that his word becomes deed? And when the parents of the dead child saw what had happened, they blamed Joseph, his father, saying, From wherever you have this child, you can't live with us in this village. If you want to be here, teach him to bless and not to curse, because our child has been taken away from us. And Joseph said to Jesus, Why do you say such things and they suffer and hate us? 
And the child said to Joseph, Since you know wise words, you're not ignorant of where they come from. And they won't be raised, and these will receive their punishment. And immediately those accusing him became blind. And Joseph took Jesus' ear and pulled hard. And Jesus said to him, It's enough for you, seek and find me, and not beyond that to scourge me by having taken on a natural ignorance. You haven't clearly seen me, why I'm yours. Look, I've been subdued before you. A teacher named Zacchaeus, standing, hearing Jesus saying these things to his father Joseph, was very amazed. And he said to Joseph, Come, give him to me, brother, so that he might be taught letters, and so that he might know all knowledge and learn to love his own age and honor old age and respect elders, so that he might acquire a yearning for children, teaching them in return. But Joseph said to the teacher, And who can control this child and teach him? Don't think of him as a small person, brother. But the teacher said, Give him to me, brother, and don't let him concern you. And the child Jesus looked at them and said to the teacher this speech, Being a teacher comes naturally to you, but you're a stranger to the name with which you're named, because I'm outside of you and I'm within you on account of the nobility of the birth of my flesh. But you, a lawyer, don't know the law. And he said to Joseph, When you were born, I existed, standing beside you so that as a father you may be taught a teaching by me, which no one else knows or can teach, and you will bear the name of salvation." And the Jews cried out and said to him, Oh, new and incredible wonder! The child is perhaps five years old, and oh, what word he says! We've never known such words. No one, neither a lawyer nor a Pharisee, has spoken like this child. And the child answered them and said, Why are you so amazed? Or rather, why don't you believe the things I've said to you? The truth is that I, who was created before this world, know accurately when you were born, and your fathers and their fathers. And all the people who heard this were speechless, no longer able to talk to him. But he went up to them, skipped around and said, I was playing with you because I know you're small-minded and amazed with small things. Now when they seemed comforted by the child's encouragement, the teacher said to the father, Come, bring him into the school. I'll teach him letters. And Joseph took his hand and led him into the school. And the teacher flattered him, brought him into the school. And Zacchaeus wrote the alphabet for him and began to teach him, saying the name, letter name frequently. But the child didn't answer him. And the child became irritated and struck him on the head. And the child became irritated and said to him, I want to teach you rather than being taught by you, since I know the letters you're teaching more accurately. To me, these things are like a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal that don't bring out the sound, nor the glory, nor the power of understanding. And when the child's anger ceased, he said all the letters by himself, from the Alpha to the Omega, very skillfully. And looking straight at the teacher, he said, If you don't know the nature of the Alpha, how can you teach another the Beta? Hypocrite! If you know, first teach me the Alpha, and then I will trust you to speak of the Beta. Then he began to teach the teacher about the first element, and he couldn't say anything to him. While many listened, he said to the teacher, Listen, teacher, and understand the arrangement of the first element. Now notice how it has a sharp line and a middle stroke, which you see pointing, standing with legs apart, coming together, going out, dragging behind, lifting up, dancing around, in triple rhythm, two-cornered of the same form, of the same thickness, of the same family, raised, balanced, isometric, of equal proportions. These are the lines of the Alpha. Wow, dude. Heavy. Anyway. When the teacher heard such good familiarity and such lines of the first letter Jesus talked about, he was baffled by such teaching and his defense. And the teacher said, Woe is me! Woe is me! I've been baffled and miserable. I've brought to shame on myself taking on this child. And it continues. I'm going to skip down a little bit. Again, after many days, Jesus was playing with other children on a certain roof of an upstairs room. And one of the children fell and died. And the other children saw this and went into their houses and left Jesus alone. And the parents of the child who had died came and accused Jesus, saying, You pushed down our child. But Jesus said, I didn't push him. And they were raging and shouting. Jesus came down from the roof and stood beside the body and cried out in a loud voice, saying, Zeno, Zeno! because this was his name, rise and say whether I pushed you down. And he rose and said, no, sir. And they saw and were amazed. And again, Jesus said to him, fall asleep. And the parents of the child praised God and worshiped the child Jesus. 
And a certain young man was splitting wood into equal parts, and he split the bottom of his foot, bled out, and died. A commotion arose, and Jesus ran there, forced his way through the crowd, seized the stricken foot, and immediately it was healed. And he said to the young man, Go, split your wood. And the crowd saw and were amazed and said, For he saved many souls from death, and he will continue to save all the days of his life. And the child Jesus was about seven years old, and his mother Mary sent him to fill up water. But there was a great crowd at the water cistern, and the pitcher was struck and broke. But Jesus spread out his cloak that he was wearing, filled it with water, and carried it to his mother. And Mary saw what sign Jesus had done. She kissed him, saying, Lord, my God, bless our child, because they were afraid lest someone bewitch him. And at the time of sowing, Jesus, uh, Joseph sowed seeds, and the child Jesus sowed one measure of wheat. And his father reaped a hundred great measures, and he gave graciously to the poor and the orphan, but Jesus took from Jesus' seed. Now, Jesus was about eight years old. His father, being a carpenter who made plows and yokes, took a bed from a certain rich man so he might make a very great and suitable. And one of the beams was shorter. It didn't have the right length. Joseph was grieved and didn't know what to do. The child came to the father and said, Sit down the two boards and line them up on your end. And Joseph did just as he said to him. And the child Jesus stood at the other end and seized the short board and stretched it. And he made it equal with the other board. And he said to his father, Don't grieve, but make whatever you want to. And Joseph embraced and kissed him, saying, Blessed am I that God gave this child to me. And then we get a second teacher and a third teacher. And then Jesus heals James' snake bite. And then Jesus heals a baby. And then Jesus heals a builder. And then we get the story of Jesus in the temple. Absolutely amazing, all of the um, elders of the church. Oh, and by the way, everybody that Jesus kills in the first half of the story, He raises about halfway through the story. So how many of you had ever heard of the boy Jesus creating birds out of mud? It's part of our cultural milieu. How many of you have ever heard that baby Jesus raised somebody from the dead? Part of our cultural milieu. Came from this pseudepigraphal book. There was a couple of things that I wanted to bring to your attention as we look at this. Most of you are grinning at me already. But l let me just deal with this theologically. John chapter 2 and verse 1. Sorry, 11, not 1. John 2, 11. Everybody can kind of put your finger there and look backwards. What's chapter 2 about? Wedding in Cana. Turning water into wine. What does John say about it? This was the first of His miraculous signs. Kind of hard to be the first if you got 14 before you were 7. You see a problem here? By the way, why did Jesus do all of these miracles in the infant Gospel of Thomas? Because He was a precocious little brat. Unlimited cosmic power in a five-year-old. Why does Jesus do miracles in the Gospel? Oh, it's right there by the way. He thus revealed His glory and His disciples put their faith in Him. Jesus never does a miracle as a dog and pony show. Every one of His miracles was for a specific purpose in the life of an individual or in the life of a community. It was never just because He could. There was always a purpose to what Jesus did. <clears throat> Since we're here, go ahead and join me in John chapter 8 and verse 46. This is the one I really want to park on is these next few verses that I want us to look at. And I want you to see how often this shows up. So I'm going to take you through six or so um, verses tonight. John chapter 8 and verse 46. Jesus speaking, backing up to 45, 
Because I tell you the truth, you don't believe Me. Can any of you prove Me guilty of sin? If I'm telling the truth, why don't you believe Me? What did He say? Open forum. Entire nation of Israel. Everybody's standing around. Can anybody ever list a single sin I've ever committed? At this point, Thomas should have stood up and said, hey, what about the kids you killed? What about the parents you blinded? You see, if this is true, how can Jesus be sinless? Go with me to Hebrews chapter 4. We're going to jump around a little bit tonight. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 and 15. Hebrews 4, 14 and 15. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Hmm. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. 2 Corinthians 5 and 21. God made Him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. Him who had no sin. Back to Hebrews again. In Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7 verses 26 through 28. The writer of Hebrews continues, such a high priest meets our need, one who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he doesn't need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. He's sinless. He's blameless. Oh, am I glad we've just spent so many months unpacking Exodus and Leviticus. What is the requirement of the animal that is to be sacrificed? Without blemish. His sacrifice, if He had sinned, would not be acceptable before God. Christ had to be sinless for the law to be fulfilled. This story can't have happened and us still have salvation. We could continue. First Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2 starting at verse 21 through verse 24 Hebrews uh, 1 Peter 2 21 through 24 to this you were called because Christ suffered for you leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps he committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth when they hurled their insults at him he did not retaliate when he suffered he made no threats Really? That's not what this story just said. This story said a guy bumped into him and he cursed him and he died. He Himself bore our sins in His body on the tree so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. And by His wounds you have been healed. By the way, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 22 is quoting Isaiah 53, 9. It was an understanding of the Old Testament in its Messianic reference that the Messiah would be without sin. And Peter is pointing out that Jesus has fulfilled this prophecy from Isaiah. In this particular conversation with 1 John chapter 3 and verse 5. 1 John 3, 5 but you know that He appeared so that He might take away our sin, and in Him is no sin. Okay? Let's see. John, Hebrews, Paul, Peter. 
four different authors in the scripture in six different or five different books. Sinless, 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 sinless. The infancy gospel of Thomas said Christ was the worst of sinners, using his eternal cosmic power to maim and destroy at will. Okay. The Gospel of Thomas. What I found the most fascinating about the Gospel of Thomas is it is the picture-perfect example of how Satan works. There are 114 verses in the Gospel of Thomas. And of those, the vast majority either are the Scripture that we keep or are so close that you go, ooh, that's interesting. I'll start reading some of these verses and you'll be like, oh, I know this one. And then I'll turn a corner with it because that's what Satan does. He starts quoting something that everybody in the church would have known and then puts a different ending, puts a different emphasis, teaches a different gospel. And then there are just some flat out stupid stuff. Okay, so there's this blend all through of pure scripture. Absolutely lines up with everything we have in the Gospels. And then there will be these few verses that take one of those and twist it. And then the next four verses will be out of this world. Completely separate from the Gospel. These are the secret sayings. Ooh. There you go, right off the top. That's why it's in the Gnostics. Although the vast majority of what we will come to understand as Gnosticism doesn't really show its form. It's only hinted at because the Gospel of Thomas is one of the earliest of the Gnostic Gospels and Gnosticism hadn't fully developed into what it would become yet. So there are some, some proto, some beginning ideas that there would be folks later that would question whether the Gospel of Thomas was even a Gnostic Gospel. Whether it, but just because it was in the Nag Hammadi, it automatically got stuck there. But these are the secret sayings which the living Jesus spoke and which Didymus Judas Thomas wrote down. He said, Whoever finds the interpretation of these sayings will not experience death. Some of you are like, hmm, wow, that's kind of out there. Actually, no, John chapter 8 and verse 51. Those who follow my words will not die but have eternal life. So again, when you start to look at it, it's not totally off. So far, so good. Jesus said, let him who seeks continue seeking until he finds. When he finds, he will become troubled. When he becomes troubled, he will become astonished and he will rule over the all. Huh? Jesus said, if you lead, if those who lead you say, see, the kingdom is in the sky, then the birds of the sky will precede you. If they say to you, it's in the sea, then the fish will precede you. Rather, the kingdom is inside of you and it is outside of you. When you come to know yourselves, then you will be known and you will realize that it is you who are the sons of the living Father. But if you will not know yourselves, you will dwell in poverty and it's you who are that poverty. Some of you guys are having 60s flashbacks. Stop it. Jesus said, the man old in days will not hesitate to ask a small child seven days old about the place of life, and he will live. For many who are first will become last, and they will become one and the same. Jesus said, recognize what is in your sight, and that which is hidden from you will become plain to you. For there is nothing hidden which will not become manifest. His disciples questioned Him and said, Do you want us to fast? How shall we pray? Shall we give alms? What diet shall we observe? Jesus said, Do not tell lies, and do not do what you hate. For all things are plain in the sight of heaven. For nothing hidden will not become manifest, and nothing covered will remain without being uncovered. 
Funny, I don't remember Jesus answering that question that way. Jesus said, Blessed is the lion which becomes man when consumed by man. And cursed is the man whom the lion consumes and the lion becomes man. And He said, The man is like a wise fisherman who cast his net into the sea and drew it up from the sea full of small fish. Among them, the wise fisherman found a fine large fish. He threw all the small fish back into the sea and chose the large fish without difficulty. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. By the way, that started in Matthew chapter 13, verses 47 and 50, and then went a totally different direction. <clears throat> Jesus said, Now the sower went out, took a handful of seeds, and scattered them. Some fell on the road, the birds came and gathered them up. Others fell on the rock, did not take root in the soil, and did not produce ears. And others fell on thorns, they choked the seeds, and worms ate them. And others fell on good soil and produced good fruit. It bore sixty per measure and a hundred and twenty per measure. Ding! We have our first full verse that lines up with Matthew 13, Mark 4, Luke 8. Exactly the same story. Maybe presented a different way than the parable you're accustomed to reading, but it's exactly the same parable. Next verse. Jesus said, I have cast fire upon the world and see I'm guarding it until it blazes. Right along with Luke chapter 12, verse 49. Again, right there. Verse 11. Jesus said, This heaven will pass away and the one above it will pass away. The dead are not alive and the living will not die. In the days when you consumed what is dead, you made what it is alive. And when you come to dwell in the light, what will you do? On the day when you were one, you became two. But when you became two, what will you do? What? The disciples said to Jesus, We know that you will depart from us. Who's to be our leader? And Jesus said to them, Wherever you are, you are to go to James the righteous, for whose sake heaven and earth came into being. Jesus said to His disciples, compare Me to someone and tell Me whom I'm like. Anybody remember this question? It's in Matthew chapter 16. Who do men say that I am? But, but hear how Thomas tells this story. Compare Me to someone and tell Me who I'm like. And Simon Peter said to him, you are like a righteous angel. And Matthew said to him, you're like a wise philosopher. And Thomas said to him, Master, my mouth is wholly incapable of saying whom you're like. And Jesus said, I am not your master. Because you have drunk and become intoxicated from the bubbling spring which I measure out. And he took him and withdrew and told him three things. And when Thomas returned to his companions, they asked him, what did Jesus say to you? And Thomas said to them, if I tell you one of the things which he told me, you will pick up stones and throw them at me, and fire will come out of the stones and burn you up. Do you know what happens at the end of Matthew chapter 16, 13 through 20? Who do men say that I am? Peter answers, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, and upon this rock I will build my church and establishes Peter as the leader. Who did Thomas just establish as the leader? Thomas. Jesus said to them, if you fast, you will rise to sin for yourselves. And if you pray, you will be condemned. And if you give alms, you will do harm to your spirits. You, when you go into any land and walk about in the districts, if they receive you, eat what they set before you and heal the sick among them. For what goes into your mouth will not defile you, but that which issues from your mouth, it is that which will defile you. His own makeup stuff and two other passages out of Scripture mishmashed together. Jesus said, when you see the one who was not born of woman, prostrate yourselves on your faces and worship him. That one is your father. Jesus said, men think perhaps that it is peace which I have come to cast upon the world. They do not know that it is dissension which I have come to cast upon the earth. Fire, sword, and war. 
For there will be five in a house. Three will be against two, and two against three, and father against the son, and the son against the father, and they will stand solitary. Almost a direct quote, but do you hear the difference in tone? A couple of words here and there. Instead of Jesus introducing the idea that His Gospel would divide households, Thomas presents that Jesus just intended to divide people from one another and leave them alone. I can go through this whole... We're on verse 17, by the way. There's 114. You you can see how this plays out? We quote Scripture. We twist Scripture. We do our own thing. We quote Scripture. We twist Scripture. We do our own thing. We twist Scripture. We do our own thing. We quote quote Scripture. It goes on like this all through the picture. And it's fascinating. I spent a good portion of today busting out which ones were Scripture, which ones were twisted, and which ones were just totally fabricated, and then lining up which Scripture it lines up with. And it's all over the New Testament. He's quoting stuff from Matthew, from Luke, from Corinthians, from what's well, tough to do if because Thomas supposedly wrote this at the same time that Matthew and Mark were writing their gospels. How do you quote Corinthians? It's kind of tough. Now I, I'm I'm There are some answers to that, and I'm not trying to be the end all know all, and I'm certainly not trying to mock. Jesus said, Blessed. Jesus said, Blessed is he who came into being before he came into being. If you became my disciples and listened to my words, these stones will minister to you. For there are five trees for you in paradise, which remain undisturbed summer and winter, and whose leaves do not fall. Whoever becomes acquainted with them will not experience death. (coughs) Excuse me. I'm not going to belabor this. If you're interested, you can look over this document. It's a lot of fun. Does anybody have any question why the churches in the first and second century didn't follow that one? You see, the Gnostic Gospels have the intentionality of preaching some secret squirrel club that you can be a part of and they offer you absolutely nothing except becoming one with the great truth and knowing all that is knowable and there's no salvation. There's no recompense against the suffering of the world. There's no hope. They've taken the philosophy and teaching of Jesus, removed its morality, removed its salvation, removed its place in the plan of God, and simply made Him a long-haired mystic. That's why it was excluded. That's why all of them were excluded. It wasn't because they were presenting a rival Gospel. Because the word Gospel means good news. They weren't offering any good news. They were offering a chance to follow me down the primrose path because I play the flute pretty. 
And unfortunately, those who follow the Pied Piper pay the price. Guys, as we have looked over these past few weeks at these writings, Nope, I got one. I got one. Okay, you can kill it. I got another one up here. Okay. Guys, I'm not... Uh, I'm not interested in making you Bible scholars or textual critics. I don't, I don't care that you can name all 72 books in the Pseudepigrapha. I don't care. But when Satan in his diabolical horridness presents things that confuse people so that they miss the cross, that's a problem. Jesus said that misunderstandings would come, but woe to them through whom it came. It would be better that a millstone was tied around the neck and thrown into the abyss. Satan has since Genesis chapter 3 been lying to people about the relationship we have with God. He didn't get tired of it when Eve and Adam bit into his lie. He's been lying ever since. The church never held a council that established these books aren't in. The church came together in a council to ask all of the churches, hey, what books are you all using? And the churches said, these. And the council said, then here's the list. The Da Vinci Code tries to promote this idea that some latter council set up some law that restricted which books got into the Bible. And that could not be further from the historical truth. The individual churches that were passing the letters were getting these various letters and they kept this one and they kept this one and they kept this one and they threw those away because they saw through the BS that they were shoveling and said that has nothing to do with the good news of Christ. That has nothing to do with the plan of God that we have seen through Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers. If Jesus comes to earth and says, I am the full physical epitome of everything in the Old Testament, then any writing that ignores that ignores the truth of who Jesus is is. These were not rival Gospels. They were lies. Because they offered no Gospel. No good news. No hope. No answer. I just get to belong to a really cool club of people who know more than everyone around us. Would you like to be in the know? Because you know, knowledge is power. By the way, this one that I said I wasn't going to go into tonight, I got off of Gnosis.org, which is one of the leading websites of the current Gnostic movement. They didn't go away in the 2nd and 3rd century. They're still here. And it's part of our cultural milieu. My whole point in bringing this to you, number one, because it was a great question, but number two is just to help us to understand that those accusations and attacks from outside the church that try to undermine the truth of Scripture by presenting a false gospel as being excluded by a false church. It was not a false church. It was the church of the living God who was protecting the truth and excluding the lie, which is exactly what we're supposed to do. Heavenly Father, I thank You for this study. I thank You for these four weeks that we've had to look at these books. And I've learned a lot.
And I hope this congregation has learned a lot. But Lord, most of all, what I come away from this with is an appreciation of the generations of godly men and women who have come before us, who have gone to the stake, who have gone to the guillotine, who have gone to the gas chamber, because they would not refute the truth. They were willing to die for it, defend it, protect it, to hand it down generation after generation to ensure that those that they were teaching knew the truth could separate and read and understand to teach. Lord, there's nothing hidden in Your Word. Every single thing that You have presented is a revelation about who You are and it doesn't take a secret squirrel ring to figure it out. Lord, You're awesome because You're not willing that any should perish. You've made Yourself available to us when we don't deserve it. You have protected Your truth when we've muddied it up and tried to make it our own. Thank You, Lord God, for these books in which we can see a consistent theme of Your grace and Your love and Your mercy. Thank You, Lord God, for Your Word. And I pray these things in the name of the Word who became flesh. Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.